ready to keep you company wherever you are. Card Blanche, the podcast, brings you immersive, hard-hitting stories anytime, anywhere, every week. Another week, another busy news cycle. Joining us for this week's edition of The Whole Week Wrap with Daily Maverick and Carte Blanche is journalist Takutswa Pongweni to unpack the latest political developments. Here's what's coming your way. First-time voters show up in full force, but will it be enough to effect change in the upcoming national elections? We talk about coalitions, again, as a minority party speaker takes her place in Joburg. The South African Local Government Association found that 32 of the 82 municipalities that have coalition governments were not functioning well. So that, of course, doesn't instill confidence in you about this working at a national level. Then the ongoing war in Gaza hits close to home as the ANC takes a stance and how one program is turning learners into leaders. Let's get into it. Welcome back to the show, Takudzwa. How have you been? I've been good. Urine fatigue is kicking in, but we just Mm. keep pushing on. Definitely. I'm also feeling it. I don't know how much is left in the tank, but chocolates and Red Bull is getting me through. (laughs) So let's get straight into the show. We have a very political show today. Last week, the IEC confirmed that about 568,000 South Africans registered to vote for the first time. It sounds like a lot, but actually, when you look at it in the context of unregistered voters in the country. It's really a small amount, to be honest. There are about 14 million unregistered voters in the country. So clearly, 568,000 isn't nearly enough if you look at it in the grander scheme of things. Why do you think the registration turnout was this low compared to 2019, where we saw just over 700,000 new registrations? You're absolutely right that If you look at them in isolation, the numbers seem great. But when you interrogate them properly, there's clearly some issues. New registrations are lower than in previous cycles. The IEC falls short of their target of 1 million registrations. And there's still a significant gap of about 14 million eligible voters that still need to be registered. Of course, there'll be another registration weekend next year and you can register anytime online. But yeah, the Mm -hmm. numbers are a bit inadequate. Regarding the low turnout, I'm not sure. I think people just feel a bit disillusioned with with politics at the moment and that a sense of hopelessness and that nothing will change even if they do register and if they do vote. So that's quite upsetting that people feel like that. And I think the encouraging part for me at least is that the bulk of this year's new registrations was made up by the youth, that being the 16 to 29 year olds. Do you think this is a sign of a youth that's eager to be more politically active? I think it's definitely a positive sign. Them making up the bulk of the new registration really counters the whole, the youth don't care about the country, democracy, and they're all Mm. apathetic, you know. I wouldn't say that applies to the South African youth. I think they just feel there's a lack of accountability by political figures and politicians. They think that their vote doesn't influence how politicians exercise public power and make decisions in the public interest. There's distrust in the political processes because of corruption and government structures. And you need that trust in order to get citizens to the polls. There's the growing negative perceptions regarding the lack of service delivery, government's failure to provide the most basic things, electricity, water, quality education, health care. I guess for the youth, it just makes them feel like it won't make a difference. Then, of course, there's the continued high youth unemployment rate, which further leads to youth dissatisfaction. I would say that the youth, it's not that they don't care. It's just that voting has not produced the results they've hoped for. Mm -hmm. And to some degree, civic education in schools is quite awful. There's very limited exposure to information about elections, how the government works, how much your vote matters, all that sort of stuff. And I think 
in the past couple of months, I've seen a lot of people online who are trying to sort of bridge that gap. Young individuals on on TikTok and YouTube reading political manifestos and just Mm. explaining things to people, doing Twitter threads or X threads, whatever it's called these days. So there's definitely a push to try bridge that gap right now. But in part, you know, I know civil society organizations have also spoken about this. The IEC isn't doing nearly enough to educate people about voting, about how you can really bring about change through voting. And in part, it's because of the budget cuts on the IEC side. But I really don't know if voter education from the IEC would make much of a difference. I think it's now a case of how voters influence each other, which will most likely play a bigger role in how the voter turnout will be next year. Political leaders are still the decision makers. They're still the ones setting the tone and the agenda and stuff. And civil society can do their part, but it's really it's up to us to be reading, to be educating each other, to be trying to push your friends to register. And you know, if we're being very honest, many of our options in the elections, for lack of a better word, they suck. <laughs> but yes. the, only, the only chance we have to make it better is to participate. Democracy is not a spectator sport. Elections are decided by people who show up. So you have the right to abstain. But if you do that, you're making it so much easier for the most incompetent official to be elected and to govern you all because their friends and family will show up and vote. The people who show up decide for all of us. So it's absolutely not too late. You can still register online anytime. There'll be another registration weekend sometime next year. So just go out there in your masses and let's do this. Absolutely. Just reclaim that power and do your bit. Her name is Margaret Arnolds, and she's the new speaker of the city of Johannesburg. As another one-seat political party representative takes up this all-important position, we cannot help but wonder about the increasingly concerning state of coalitions in South Africa. And with elections nearing, we're running out of time to figure this whole thing out. Sticking to politics, Joburg has a new speaker. This time it's Margaret Arnold. She's the third speaker in two years, which in itself shows just how tumultuous these coalition governments are. But again, we have a speaker from a minority party, this time from the African Independent Congress or AIC. Arnold is quite outspoken at times. I mean, even in her opening remarks when she was voted in, she referred to some people as that lot. So she she's not mincing her words. Do you see this working in her favor in the long run, having such an outspoken, very direct direct speaker? Or do you see her kind of towing the political line and and kind of sticking with the ANC, the EFF and PA alliance just to keep them happy? Given how coalitions have been going in the past, I'll be interested to see how it pans out, how coalitions in general will pan out. You know, a lot of the conversations we've had about coalitions have been focused on the municipal level. But With the upcoming general elections, there is a a prospect of a coalition government at provincial and even national level. Some polls suggest that the ANC could fail to secure 50% of the vote required to form a government. And with no other party tipped to meet that threshold, there might be a coalition instead. So I think coalitions are here to stay. And now we should be posing pertinent questions and asking ourselves, how do we make coalition government work better? Because clearly there are some issues that definitely need to be addressed. Yeah, this conversation around coalitions has been going on for well over a year. I think it started piquing people's interest in 2022 when coalition governments started really becoming more common across the country. But it's clear that we haven't figured out how coalitions should work, especially on a municipal level. So I think the concern is that if we can't get it right on a municipal level, how on earth are we going to get it right? on a national level. Very valid concern. The South African Local Government Association found that 32 of the 82 municipalities that have coalition governments were not functioning well. So that, of course, doesn't instill confidence in you about this working at a national level. And there have been some proposals on how best we can address this. One of the more controversial ones and far-reaching proposals under consideration is the introduction of electoral thresholds for a party to win a seat in a council or legislature. 
The threshold being pushed by the ANCA and the DA is 1% of the vote to ensure representation at the national and provincial level. And it's still unclear what threshold is being considered for local government level. The reason this threshold is so controversial is because if the ANC and DA get their way, minority parties like ACDP, UDM, Good, COPE, all of them, they won't have MPs in parliament. And Currently, altogether, they make up 18 of the 400 seats in Parliament. So if the proposal was suddenly effective tomorrow morning, it would mean that only ANC, DA, EFF, IFP and Freedom Front Plus would be the only parties represented in Parliament. And you can see why smaller parties are completely opposed to this idea, because it will lead to fewer parties and councils and legislators and the larger parties consolidating their power, which is a valid concern. There are two other proposals. One of them is the introduction of an independent body to mediate disputes between coalition partners. Maybe that could limit the musical chair situation that Joba constantly finds himself with the mayors and the speakers. Then there's also a proposal to have coalition agreements published before elections. I don't know if coalitions could work nationally. It feels a bit delusional to think they could, given just how unstable and turbulent mm, coalitions yeah. have been. But they, they could be a reality. And it's very important that we start thinking about that. Coalitions are indeed here to stay. And unfortunately, I think we've reached a point now where we're going to have to figure things out as we go. We can't test the waters any longer. We just have to now see what happens. South Africa can learn from conditions in which coalitions elsewhere have been conducive to stable and accountable democratic governments. International Mm -hmm. experience suggests that what tips the balance in favor of stable rather than these polarized coalitions is the willingness of political elites to prioritize collective interest over political opportunism. So Mm -hmm. coalition politics will serve as a test of the values of political leaders. It will serve as a test of the strength of democratic institutions to mediate conflict, to ensure accountability. It will also serve as a test to see if political parties can agree on how to share power. Sometimes I feel like elected officials forget their common goal, which is to serve the people. So in order to serve the people effectively, coalition governments have to just figure out a way to make this work. This past week, a motion to cut ties with Israel pending a ceasefire and UN-led negotiated settlement was adopted in Parliament. From closing embassies to suspending diplomatic ties, the impact of this decision is far-reaching. But it seems internally not even the ruling party can agree on the best approach in this hugely complex gauntlet. I want us to chat about South Africa's stance on Israel. Last week, we saw some dramatic movements from the ANC, whereby it voted to close the Israeli embassy in Pretoria and suspending all diplomatic ties. They did say until a ceasefire is agreed upon, but that ceasefire has to essentially result in long-term peace. The matter is still to be voted on by the National Assembly this coming week. But firstly, what does closing the embassy actually mean? What are the implications? When an embassy is closed in a country, it means that the embassy and its associated consults are not operational and are not providing services to the public. If there's a diplomatic dispute between two countries, one country may decide to close its embassy in the other country as a political statement to to show disapproval, which is what the NC is doing right now. And as you just said, it still needs to be voted upon by cabinet in the coming weeks. So right now, it's all a bit symbolic. But Mm. it's it's a good start and an important start to show support to the Palestine cause uh, for freedom. And the DA has raised concerns regarding the withdrawal of consular services in both Tel Aviv as well as locally, arguing exactly what you've just said. You know, it leaves South Africans stranded, essentially. The DA went as far as to say that severing ties with Israel will lead to us no longer having any influence in the outcome of this war. So clearly it isn't a straightforward decision. We have to acknowledge that South Africans are also still in both Israel as well as in Palestine. And basically closing the doors on them could have devastating impacts for the South Africans there. Absolutely. I think 
South Africa's position on this has created or illustrated deep division among opposition politicians and mm. everyone is, is voicing concerns. Some people are, are just using this as an opportunity to spew hate. I don't know about the DA stance, to be honest. I think South Africa and Palestine have had historic relations for decades and mm. South Africa has been one of the most prominent voices critical of Israel globally. So this decision, I wouldn't say it just like comes out of nowhere. You know, there's, mm. there's history and context behind that. But also within the ANC, there's also some division because you had President Cyril Ramaphosa stating that Israel should be investigated by the International Criminal Court for war crimes. He also called for the embassy to be closed. And then you had International Relations and Cooperation Minister Naledi Pandor coming forward and saying, hold on, breaking off diplomatic relations will be what she called counterproductive. I think Zipro officials are being put in a difficult situation to maintain normal relations. They did recall diplomats from the embassy in Tel Aviv, Mm. and there's a notice on the embassy that says it's closed. As you said, Ramaphosa has, in a way he's welcomed it, but it's also been a non-committal response, you know, about about severing political ties. And there's an amendment in the proposal that was made. Government has agreed to close the Israeli embassy in South Africa and suspend diplomatic relations with Israel until a ceasefire is agreed and Israel commits to binding UN-facilitated negotiations. So I feel like there's wiggle room over there. Yeah, well, we'll see what the next few days will bring. And I think the next sitting is on the 29th of November when this vote will come before National Assembly. So let's see what comes from that, if there, if anything changes between now and then. Since 2009, the Columba Leadership Program has equipped young people across South Africa with the skills needed to become great leaders. The program aims to transform young students into individuals who will not only make a success of their own lives, but encourage others to do the same. I want us to really finish things off with some feel-good news. I think it's necessary after everything we've discussed today. And you brought this wonderful story to my attention. It's about the Columba Leadership Program, which aims to help youngsters become great leaders. Columba Leadership is this really great organization that aims to give school staff and pupils the skills and visions to tackle a wide range of issues. They work with the Department of Education to select a pool of suitable schools. They're very geared on giving you leadership skills to to tackle these issues. Uh, A few weeks ago, a colleague of mine went and was born in Pretoria that specializes in maths and science. And the students and principal at the school informed study club's performance have improved significantly since the pupils started working with Columbi, which is just great. Yeah. And when I read the Daily Maverick article on this, I loved this specific paragraph. It says, uh, quote, Hackland, uh, the CEO of Columba, said they do not treat young people like empty vessels to be filled with content. She said the programs focus on unlocking potential. And I think that's such an important point for teachers and parents alike to keep in mind, you know, to really focus on building on a child's strengths instead of just trying to take this copy paste approach to educating them. And what I also loved about this program is that they encourage the pupils to really use those skills to uplift the students around them. It's sort of like a mentorship program that kind of grows out of this leadership program, which I just found lovely. It's a beautiful initiative and it doesn't just end there. After you're done, they keep in contact with you. They have this great alumni mobilization that's driven largely through WhatsApp and it focuses on on issues of relevance and interest of the youth. There's peer support and motivation for one another, continued involvement and showcasing of social action, business marketing, where individuals can network and showcase their small businesses. It's all very lovely. It was founded in 2009, and I think they've worked in over 200 schools at present. They have a very rigorous monitoring and evaluation system, which allows them to gauge their impact. Their CEO, Tracy, she explained that between 72 to 74 percent of Columbia graduates get recognized as formal leaders of their school, becoming part of the RCL or having some kind of leadership responsibility 
at the school. And just what you said about unlocking potential, they don't just target leaders. They're not going into schools and saying, give me your best leaders and we'll make them better. Mm -hmm. They see greatness in everyone and they're making sure they send a diverse group to the academy for the better. I love that. I mean, this has been such an informative and rich discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope to have you back on the show very, very soon. Thank you for having me. I always have a great time here. And yes, there's a lot to, to keep up with and get a bit overwhelming and all doom and gloom. But I'm happy to help people understand it and remind you there's pockets of sunshine in every part of the country. Yes, and we should hold on to those pockets because they get us through the most. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's a wrap. In case you missed any of our previous chats with Daily Maverick, you can find them all on Carte Blanche, the podcast, available on Spotify and all major podcasting platforms.